Greetings from Katharangam. Katharangam is an organization that works with stories as a tool in education, business, communication. Stories connect us across the world. We have been spreading the, ma the magic of stories to children of all ages and adults alike. I, Shreya, on behalf of Katharangam, welcome all of you to this extravaganza of stories, lights, and legends. Now, as we start, the lights are the theme, core theme of today's session. So I will start with lighting a small lamp. Subham karoti kalyanam arogyam dhana sampada shatru buddhi vinashaya deepa jyotir namastate. This shloka, it means that I bow down to the light. The light that brings prosperity auspiciousness, good health, abundance of wealth, and it destroys the darkness, the ignorance, and it takes us on a beautiful journey. Light gives us life. It enriches our soul, and that is why we live. So we here celebrate light and the upcoming festival that we celebrate light with is Dipavali. Dipavali means, Dipavali is a Sanskrit word which means a row of lights. During Dipavali people decorate their houses with rows of lamps and that is why this festival is known as Diwali or Dipavali. It is one of the most important festivals here in India. And it is widely observed by billions of people here, irrespective of their caste, creed, or religion. It is not about only a religious festival. We celebrate Diwali across faiths. We celebrate Diwali across the entire Indian diaspora. It is marked by prayers, feasts, firecrackers, and of course, the lighting of lamps. The main theme of Dipavali is triumph of light over darkness, of knowledge over ignorance, of good over evil. That is why this festival is the festival of humanity. And this is the core theme of today's session. All the storytellers who have come all across the world who are sitting here with us are going to share stories on this place. So now, without much ado, let me take you directly to our first storyteller. A country in Europe which has a long Mediterranean coastline. The intellectual faculties of humankind have found a welcome home in this country. It's a country with the most important centers of religion, visual arts, literature, music, culinary art, and science. Stefania Ganzini comes from this country, Italy. She loves to listen to stories, and she's one of the co-founders of the Italian Storytelling Center. We are happy to welcome Stefania amidst us, and we are waiting to listen to Stefania's story.
Stefania, can you unmute yourself? What? Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> So I was saying that uh, thank you. It's a really uh, pleasure and an honor to be with you and uh, celebrate Diwali, even if it's uh, well just online. But it's also a great opportunity just to cross borders and uh, to connect with people all over the world. And uh, actually, here in Italy, uh, in about one month, uh, let's say on the 13th of December, uh, we will too celebrate, let's say, our version of the Feast of Lights, because it's of course a Catholic version, and so it's linked to a saint, and that saint is Saint Lucy. And uh, Lucy, the name of the saint, uh, her name, which is in Italian is Lucia, comes from the Latin lux, which means light. And uh, uh, the saint, so her story and the story of her martyrdom is strictly connected with light, so with the ability to see, and also the ability to see also the holy light. And so that she is the patron saint of the blind. But it is not by chance that here she is celebrated on the 13th of December, because that day here is the shortest day of the year in terms of daylight. And so what we are actually celebrating is the fact that from the following day on, days will start to be longer in terms of daylight. So we will enjoy more light and darkness will gradually start to fade away. This is, of course, linked also to uh, counter traditions, so to the idea of a new beginning, of a new growing season beginning, but it is also a highly symbolic meaning. Because in our religion, we don't have a, a physical image of God. So God is represented, is portrayed, so to say, as a great light. And so all the saints and all the holy people are always portrayed with an aura of light surrounding them. And so it's, a, again, a celebration that has a lot to do with the idea of the triumph of good over evil, so of the light over darkness. And it's a very important feast that St. Saint Lucy is very much celebrated here in Italy. And um, until a few years ago, it used to be a bank holiday. And it's celebrated, celebrated with music and dancing along the streets. And there are, of course, stores full of, full of food because we are in Italy. So, you know, food is a very important element of our culture. And the special um, sweets are given to children as a present. But when I moved to this, to this area of Italy, because I, well, I come from the northeastern part of Italy, and then I moved more, a little bit more to the center, I also find out that that day, the day of St. Lucy, is also the day of uh, fiancés and girlfriends, and especially of brides to be. And so again, I think that that's connected to the idea of a new beginning. So a new, li a new light starting in, your, in one's life. And so uh, the, the story that I'd like to share with you today has a lot to do with all these topics so with light, with darkness, with good and evil. And uh, it's, let's say it's my version of, uh, of a tale by uh, Gianni Rodari, who's a famous, maybe the most famous and most important Italian author of children's book. And uh, it's a story that uh, while it was, when I heard it was really, let's say, love at first sight. And so I hope that you will enjoy it and that at the end, you will love it as much as I do. And now, So, one day in a very faraway town, a very special baby was born. On the one hand, it was a baby like all other babies. He had chubby legs and chubby arms woof, and chubby cheeks. Sorry, I'm missing. Ah, uh, then I'll start again. It doesn't work. I'm afraid we'll have to do without a candle. I've gone, <laughs> sorry. So one day in a very faraway town, a very special baby was born. 
On the one hand, he looked like all other babies. He had chubby legs and chubby arms and chubby cheeks and you just wanted to pitch them. But on the other, he had something really unique because he was transparent. Yes, transparent. Yes, he was made of flesh and bones. But if you look at him, you could just see through him. Like when you look through the air or through crystal clear waters and you can see the button. So it looked like if you were made of glass, but unlike glass, it was not fragile at all. It was very strong and very tough. And if he fell, well, if he fell, he didn't break. Maybe he just got a bump on his head. A transparent bump, of course. But because it was transparent, all the people could not see, could see his organs and they could also see his feelings. They could see his heart beating slowly when he was sleeping and making beautiful dreams, or sleeping faster, or, or breathing faster when he was excited for something. And they could also see his mind and they could see his thoughts. And they were children's thoughts. So they were uh, playful and funny and they were colorful and they looked like thousands and thousands of colorful fishes jumping here and there and swimming in a tropical sea. And now the name of this child was Giacomo. But because of his peculiar feature, it was nicknamed Giacomo di Cristallo, which means Giacomo made of crystal. But well, time passed and Giacomo grew up. And uh, apart from being transparent, well, he was like all other children. And like all other children, he got into mischief and he also told his first lie. But it was a lie that lasted really for just one second. Because as soon as uttered his last word, a small ball of fire formed onto his forehead and he started to roll around, around, around. And so all the people understood that he told a lie. And that lie, no, it was not a lie, so he couldn't but tell the truth and he promised that he would never tell a lie again in his whole life. And then one day, one of his friends wanted to confide in his secret. Giacomo, this is a very special secret. I'll tell you just to you, you promise you won't tell anyone. And Giacomo did want to keep that secret, but he simply, he, simply, he couldn't. Indeed. As soon as his friend had finished whispering his secret into his ear, a black ball formed onto his Giacomo's chest and started to roll around, around, around. And so all the people could see that, could see that secret and that secret was no longer a secret. But again, time passed and Giacomo grew up and he became a young and handsome man. And he was very much loved by all the people of his town because, of course, he was very sincere, he was very loyal, but he was also a very warm hearted man. And the days were peaceful and joyful, and the sun was always shining on that town. But then one day, dark clouds started to loom on the horizon, and they soon covered all the sky hiding the sun in, cre in creating deadly shadows. Indeed, on that day, a very cruel and violent dictator came to power. And so a very bad period started, a period of violence, a period of fear, a period during which all the people suffered and suffered a lot and nobody dared to do anything. Because if anybody protested, they disappeared and nobody knew anything about them anymore. And if anyone is there to, to rise against the dictator, they were shot dead immediately with no trial. And so all the people suffered and suffered in silence and nobody dared to say anything, nobody except Giacomo. Because even if Giacomo did not utter a word, his thoughts spoke for him. And of course, there were thoughts of freedom, of justice and of democracy. And when the people met him on the street and they saw those thoughts, they got strength and hope from those thoughts. 
to try and resist one day longer. Of course, the dictator knew about uh, Giacomo and of course he could not allow him to go around and spread those thoughts. But he also knew that he could not kill him because if he did it, all the people would rise against him. And so he decided to jail him and to put him in the most remote and, and coldest and darkest cell of the prison. And Giacomo did not object, but then something extraordinary happened because as soon as Giacomo stepped into his cell, the walls of the cell became transparent. And then the entire walls of the prison became transparent. And then the entire outer walls of the prison became transparent. And so all the people passing by, they could see Giacomo sitting there in his cell. But above all, they could see thoughts. And they were thoughts of justice and of freedom and of democracy that were even stronger than before. And when the night fell, again, something extraordinary happened because those thoughts became bright. They became luminous and they shed a very strong and powerful light all around, a far reaching light that reached even the palace of the dictator. And of course the dictator, he could not stand it. And so he ordered that the curtains be pulled, but it didn't work. And so he ordered that all windows be bolted so that not even the smallest bit of them was left uncovered. But again, it didn't work because that light was so strong and so powerful that it would filter through anything and no obstacle could stop it. And so when the dictator went to bed, <laughs> he do whatever he can not to see that light. And so he covered himself with layers and layers of blankets and he pushed his head under his pillow, but it was useless. And so he had to sleep all night long with that light covering his entire body. And so while he was sleeping, night after night, that light started to get into his head. And from his head, it started to drip into his heart. Dip, 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 dip. And when all the light that was in his head had dripped into his heart, the dictator felt no longer the same. He no longer felt so cruel and violent and he understood all the bad things he had done, all the suffering that he has caused, and he repented for it. And so the day after, he ordered that all prisoners be freed and he summoned all the people in the main square and he asked them to forgive him because he had understood all his sins. And when the dictator finished speaking, there was a moment of silence in the square. Of course, the people were very angry. They were fools with the dictator and they looked at each other and they didn't really know what to do. But then they look up at the sky and they saw that the dark clouds were starting to disappear and that the sun was starting to shine again. And so they understood that if they took revenge on the dictator, those clouds would not go away. And so they forgave him and the dictator left and nobody knew anything about him anymore. And then of course the people asked Giacomo to become their new guide. But Giacomo replied, sorry, but I can't. I've got a bigger mission to accomplish. Just call free and democratic elections and you will find the right man to guide you. And having said that, he set off on a long journey to bring light to the countries and towns that were still wrapped in darkness. It's so beautiful, awesome story, it's really nice. And I think the story that just now Mr. Tanya said, and the culture in, uh, she was talking about the festival of St. Lucia, and 
Do you have similar festivals in your country? We have the festival of life. It's very similar. It's such a beautiful one. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it. He says it's really beautiful. And uh, Andrea, do you have similar uh, festivals or things in your country? Um, do. Well, I'm I'm coming from America, um, but I'm Jewish in America. So my people are like a, you know, within a country. Okay. And we have uh, Hanukkah at this time of year. Oh, and okay. that story actually, oh, it was so beautiful. When the light comes in to the, to the king, um, we have a, a lot of stories like that in which uh, the, the ruler tries to not be transformed by that power. And sometimes they are, and sometimes they aren't. Um, but that was a very beautifully familiar story. And uh, in our country, in America, uh, the streets are usually decorated um, at the start around the end of November. It used to be just for Christmas and, and now cities make it for the whole, the whole of the winter where uh, you'll have little, little white lights or colored lights that are strung up on the trees and they'll go across the street sometimes and different cities will do it in different ways. Um, so we also have a, an attempt to light up the streets and light up the houses, even separate from people's religions. You know, there is a folk tale here in India. Uh, she said that once there was an old man who was blind. And he lived all alone because he had uh, no family. And this blind man, when he went out in the dark in his village, he would always carry a lantern, a lighted lamp. So people thought that he was mad. Why does this blind man walk around with a lighted lamp? He can't even see. So what does he have the lamp for? So one day it was quite dark and as this blind man was walking through the streets with his lighted lamp in his hand, a few men who were coming from the opposite direction, they just started laughing and they just started laughing at him and they started making fun of him and he said well you are blind why are you carrying a lamp in your hand who's going to you don't need it anyway the old man the blind man he stopped and he smiled and he said i don't need i don't need this lamp I don't need the light. I see through my mind. And I have a walking stick with me that guides me on the road. This land is for people who see with their eyes. It's for you. And it is a story that comes from one corner of India, and it's a beautiful story about that. We shouldn't be judgmental, right? We should see one's light, it's my light lights up yours, and that's that. So now, from one very powerful story, a story which is still reeling in my mind, we will go to another part of the world, another continent. One of the most influential countries of the world, United States of America, is a federal union of 50 states. And Andrea Cummins comes from the United States of America. Andrea is a storyteller, she's a religious school teacher, She's a mom of five beautiful children, and she lives in the northeast coast of the United States. She runs Youth Standing Strong Center. It's an online storytelling camp that matches kids 
and teenagers with adult mentors from around the world. And Andrea loves the possibilities that Zoom has given her for these connections. And honestly, I love this possibility that Zoom has given us to connect people from all across the world and bring them to this one platform. So we are waiting for you, Andrea, to share your story. Thank you. Am I supposed to, there we go. <laughs> I'm going to take you not to the United States where I live, but to the country, to the land where my people come from. In those days long ago, the ancient Greek empire was spreading across the Middle East and Alexander the Great spared Jerusalem. They say he had a dream of a man in white garments walking at night on the road. And then he was walking on the road and there was the man, it was a, a priest. He was, he was wearing white robes and under them the purple and the scarlet clothing and the little crown on his head in the name of God that cannot be pronounced. And he approached and they gave peace to each other. And Alexander spared the city, which means he let the Jews keep living where they were living while his empire surrounded them. We considered him so nice, we named children after him to this day. But you know what it means when there's an empire surrounding you. The story went on for generations and little by little, a discriminatory law here, a culture war there, and the Jews became foreigners in a country where some people decided what was Greek and what was not. So now we have a villain, Antiochus. And with a villain, you can fight battles. So the battle for independence began. It was more exciting than that story of the little boy, Alexander, who jumped on the back of a big black horse and, and rode off to become king. It was thrilling because we were on the horses. The Maccabees, the little ragtag Jewish army, ran off into the hills that surrounded Jerusalem, called by the rallying cry, all who are with the Lord, follow me. There were heroic women, double spies, martyrs, women who jumped to their death, holding their babes in their arms rather than surrender. There was a ballad of a mother, Hannah, who watched as each of her seven sons refused to bow down to the tyrant. They wouldn't accept bribes, not even the appearance of surrender, lest their fellow resistors lose heart. And so each of her sons was killed in front of her. There were horses and chariots and elephants. One of the Maccabees, Eleazar, rode his horse underneath one of those war elephants of the Syrian Greeks and thrust his sword up into its belly and it collapsed on him and his horse and they were killed. Oh. As a child, I devoured those stories. If you ever wanted to feel powerful when you were a little people inside a big people, if you ever wanted to turn the tables on all those stories your relatives told you about this country that we fled from and this person who didn't make it out in time, Hanukkah was the holiday for that. Hanukkah, where every year we celebrated the victory of a little people 
against the mighty empire. Strange then that when we actually celebrate Hanukkah, now at the darkest time of the year, we don't do anything from any of those stories. We don't have any iconography of horses or elephants. There are no trumpets of war. We don't run around the hillsides waving swords. We don't sing the ballad of Hana. We don't even set off firecrackers. It's a strangely quiet holiday. We gather in homes and we fry up treats in oil. Depending on your country, maybe jelly donuts, maybe dough wrapped in nuts and honey with cardamom and cinnamon, maybe grated potatoes and onions fried to a crisp brown pancake and topped with sour cream or applesauce. Our big debate is which is better, sour cream or applesauce. We give gifts in the countries that are dominated by Christmas. The gifts might be big sometimes, but Hanukkah has a tradition of being for little things, tokens. There are chocolates wrapped in foil shaped like coins and you get books and games and an $18 check from grandma and the expectation that you'll put some of it away to give tzedakah for the poor and those ubiquitous winter scarves and hats and socks. If your children are in Jewish school, they might get sent home early for it's the darkest time of the year and they'll have no homework for the whole week because we light these lights and they're not to be used to read by or sew by or do homework by, no. They're only to publicize the miracle. I didn't tell you about the miracle, did I? That's okay, the, the chronicles in the book of Maccabees about those battles, it doesn't mention the miracle either. No one mentions that miracle until years, decades after the story happened. It's almost as if our rabbis made it up. It goes like this. After three years of fighting, the Jews were finally victorious. And we set about that mundane job of post-war cleanup. The Holy Temple had been trashed, garbage thrown in it, non-kosher blood from animals splattered on the altar, Things had been smashed and broken and shattered. It took a long time and a lot of cleaning and mending and fixing. And finally, it was ready for prayers. It was ready for rededication. All we had to do was light the menorah, the great branched candle lamps, that the priest had been lighting every day since the time of the Bible. And there were rules. The oil for those lamps had to be fresh olive oil pressed just for that occasion. And it had to be put into special jars and sealed with the seal of the priest. And they looked and they looked, but they could only find one. They poured in the oil. I used to wonder about it as a child. Why didn't they wait? It was one week away from the place where the oil would be pressed. Why didn't they wait the week? But it had been so long and they were here and they had one jar. They poured what they had, they lit what they had. And I think you know what happened. If you were going to make up a story that would last after the war through all that would come, 
that oil that was supposed to burn for one day, when the priest came the next morning and checked, it was still burning. Second day, third day, every day the priest came to check, it was still burning. Four, five, six, seven, eight days, and the new oil arrived. That's the story we tell. We fry up treats in that oil. We gather in homes for our small and sacred tasks. We spin little tops with Hebrew letters on them in a gambling game that even preschoolers think is a little stupid and gloat when we have a pile of pennies that we won from our siblings. We unwrap socks. It's the most mundane and homebody of our holidays, right up against Christmas at the darkest time of the year. We light lights. Thin little candles. And we put them in these thin little menorahs. And we light one from another, from another, from another, adding one each night for eight nights. And then we put them in our windows because everyone is supposed to see the miracle. Because that ancient temple in Jerusalem had these special windows that were narrow on the inside and wide on the outside to let out the light to the world. Because after all these centuries with so many battles we've needed to fight, we hope that if we can light one light to one light to one light, if we pour in what we have, there is no darkness that we cannot drive out of our sacred space. And we light these in every country where the Jews find themselves, every place we've been sent in the diaspora, because there is no place that isn't sacred place. And there is no place that doesn't need a little light. It's such a beautiful story, Andrea. Such a beautiful story. Exactly. There is no place that is not a secret place. And there is no place that doesn't need an answer. Thank you for sharing this beautiful story. I, I know you had uh, asked uh, for a little bit about the holiday. Um, and what our culture's uh, relationship was to freedom and light. So I think I covered the holiday pretty well with the story. Um, but the rabbis told this story at a time when the temple that had been cleaned up and rededicated had been destroyed again. And the Jews had already been sent out and they didn't have access to the temple or the land. So it really became the holiday of the diaspora. Um, and a lot of people think that it only became popular because of Christmas or because of the time of year, um, but I don't think so. Um, the Maccabees themselves were religious extremists and they became corrupt rulers also. So this story was a kind of reclaiming of religious power away from leaders and to individual people. And I think that is going to become powerful for any people, especially a diaspora people. And uh, the idea of light is the very first thing that God creates in our creation story is light. And God calls light good. So our Torah starts out with the spirit of God hovering over the darkness and speaking light into existence. And I love the idea that maybe a bunch of rabbis a long time ago spoke a miracle into existence and gave us this holiday. 
just just wonderful and see how these stories I and mean, even here we have not the same but similar kind of uh, stories that connect us here and it is just just wonderful so are you do you have any such similar uh, stories that come from your country from indonesia yes you have similar kind of things in the in your country as well in indonesia as well yeah yeah we have some uh, similar stories and also a few story that uh, tell you light against the darkness yeah. so i think in every culture we have have those kind of stories. Uh, yeah. It's just beautiful how, uh, I mean, there's such, it is, I think, wherever humanity exists, uh, the light exists and stories exist. And that's how we are all connected. Beautiful stories. In India also, like we celebrate uh, Dipavali, it's again the same celebration of good over evil, of truth over ignorance, of light over justice. And uh, we celebrate five days of festivities. So on the first day, which is the main uh, Diwali, is on the third day in between, which is actually happens to be our no moon day. So on the 13th, the previous, the so first it starts with a celebration called Dhan Teras on the 13th. So here we celebrate or we pray to the goddess of Lakshmi who brings you. And there are innumerable mythological stories that surround these five days of celebration. On the second day, we call it Narak Chaturdashi or the day where good triumphed over evil. Again, there are such beautiful stories that connect this day. On the third day, we celebrate Diwali of Diwali. On the fourth day, there is something called Overthan Puja, where again, there's a wonderful story which connects uh, Govardhan Puja to the rest of, well, we have to find some other time to share all these stories. And on the fifth day, which is very different from all of this, it's we celebrate what we call Bhai Duj, when a sister prays for the well-being of her brother. So somewhere from all these uh, mythological stories and where we are celebrating about gods and all of a sudden, on the fifth day, we are shifting to humanity itself, finding out brothers and sisters and celebrating life as humans. Today, we have amongst us Vijaya Bhagavadi. She loves reading and she enjoys writing stories and poems. Vijaya has lived in different cities all across the world and as a result, she has a little interaction into different cultures, their cuisines, their way of life. What travel teaches us. She is an eternal learner and she loves to travel. She wants to keep learning and she enjoys learning yoga and painting. She celebrates life in itself. Today, Vijay is going to share some story from India. Hello, everybody. So beautiful to listen to the stories by from Italy and Hanukkah story about one candle lighting to the other. This is exactly what the meaning of Deepavali is, as Shreya was explaining. It's one lamp that is lit to remove darkness in that space. 
and another lamp taking light from that and making a row of little lamps to welcome prosperity, light, knowledge, a lack of fear, a sense of well-being, positive thinking, welcoming all the good vibes on the darkest night of the month. Today I'm going to go into the story of the main part of how the festival of Deepavali is celebrated, which is the puja or the prayer to the goddess Lakshmi. Goddess Lakshmi is the wife of Lord Vishnu. And as a couple, they strive to preserve balance in the world. What happens is once the world is created, it needs to be kept in balance. The good needs to always come back to balance out what is going wrong. And this we've seen very differently across time and all parts of the world. So for the restoration of balance, both Vishnu and Lakshmi are very, very important in the Indian Hindu mythology. Tonight, on the night of Diwali, the darkest night of the month, and the day after I think we lost lead her into our house because she's the goddess of prosperity, well-being, good health, and we all want her to come and stay with us and bring those good values and well-being in our lives. I'll tell you a story about how Lakshmi was found and the significance of how the Diwali and light happened, Deepavali and light happened on this darkest night, month, night of the month. One day in the heavens, the king of the gods, his name is Indra, and he was riding on this big white mythological elephant called Airavat. He was a man full of himself and felt the weight of his well being, his prosperity and opulence. So he was happily riding on his elephant and going. And there was this very pious, renowned saint, Rishi Durvasa, who was wearing a garland of marigold flowers and he walked up to him. And as a blessing to the king of gods, the Rishi's revered Rishi removed his garland and handed it over to Indra. Indra received it with humility, but very carelessly left it on the head of the elephant as he was riding past. And the elephant found it uncomfortable and just shook its head. What happened to the garland that was on the head of the elephant? It fell down, it rolled down. The elephant's next step, footstep trampled on the flowers. Rishi Durvasa was enraged to see this, that somebody who is supposed to be the king of gods is not able to revere the token blessing that he has received from a seer. So he curses him and he says, your prosperity, the opulence, the power that you thrive on is all going to vanish because of this arrogance that you have. And before Indra could react, the Shri that he carries with him, the Shri is the, the well-being and the immense opulence that he has, abundance that he has in the heavens as a king, all disappears. He feels a lack of power in his body and in the environment around him. There's a weakness that has set in. So very meekly, the mighty king, no longer so mighty, goes and checks on all the people in gods in his kingdom and they're all feeling weak and low. There's no light, it's all dim. And they begin to feel a sense of fatigue. That I can't do anything anymore. So they need to recharge their batteries. So the, who do they turn to? The preserver of the universe, which is Lord Vishnu. They all go up to him and say, oh, the preserver of universe, Lord Vishnu, please, please do something. It was 
my folly, Indra says, it's my folly. I failed to regard the blessings of Rishi Durvasa, which came to me in the form of a flower garland, a simple flower garland, which I did not recognize in my blindness and arrogance. I disregarded it and look where it has led us. The heavenly abode is no longer so powerful. We miss that, we want it. So please, please help us. So Lord Vishnu says, we have to suffer the consequences of all our actions, Indra, but there is a way out. I can help you. Now that Lakshmi and Sri have gone and hidden in the bottom of the ocean, Lakshmi is known as a daughter of the ocean, daughter of the earth, everything that is nature, she's the daughter of those powers which actually come out to help us to live a better life on earth. So she's gone back home to the bottom of the ocean. You will have to churn the milky ocean and get the powerful magical elixir of life called Amrit back out of the ocean to be able to rekindle the energy that you have lost, get back the Shri that you had and enlightenment and knowledge and light and happiness and health to restore this balance and become powerful and be the no lead the normal life that you are used to. You need to be able to churn the ocean and bring Lakshmi back out and get the Amrit and be able to drink it. Once you are able to receive the holy Amrit out of the ocean and have it, that is when you will um, get back your powers. So Indra says, let's do this. Come on, come on, let's go in a very meek voice because he's no longer so powerful. Lord Vishnu says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You are no longer as powerful to do it all by yourself. You will need the power of the Asuras who are the demons who have many good qualities, but they have something that is pulling them down, which is their arrogance, their self-centeredness, and their unwillingness to share and work for the common good. So they are the demons, the asuras. So they're very powerful people. So you might want to get their help in order to churn the milky ocean, and it's going to take a while, so be prepared. So they go and request the mighty Indra goes to Bali, the leader of Asuras, the king of Asuras, and request them, please, can you help us? We need to bring Amrit back out, Lakshmi back out of the ocean, and the Shri back out of the ocean, so that we can all live a life of balance, a life of light, knowledge, and prosperity in our own space. It's all dark now and cold and lonely, and we're all tired, so we need your help very humbly requesting. The Asuras feel very mighty now. The holy gods are there to request them for help. No better day than this. So Bali conspires with his group. They have a meeting and he says, let's help them and then trick them. Grab the pot of Amrit as we get it out of the ocean and take it all just for ourselves. And we are going to be undefeatable, we're going to live forever and no God can do us anyhow. We will rule the world, the heaven, earth and the underworld, all of the universe. And we will wait and be the ones laughing at the gods led by Indra. Now, Bali and his Asuras are very happy to help because they have an ulterior motive. They all come to the milky ocean and say, let's start churning. What do we churn it with now? So they find this conical mountain called Mandara and place it in the waters into the milky ocean. And they need something like a rope to churn it with. What do they find? Lord Shiva has this big snake around his neck called Vasuki. He brings it and gives it to them. And he says, you may use Vasuki to help you. So they wrap it around the Mount of Mandara and start to decide who's going to hold which end. Will the asuras be by the tail or the devas be by the head? The devas think for a moment and Indra goes to Bali and says, 
we want to be by the head of Vasuki. Immediately, Bali and the Asuras want to deny them what they think might be a better thing to do. He says, if you want the head side, we want it too. So you move to the side of the tail. Now Indra and the gods had no other option. So they moved to the side of the tail, which actually seemed to have worked out better for them because once they started to go by the side of the head, every time the churning happened, the gods pulled and the asuras had to release. And the asuras pulled and the gods had to release. It was not like a tug of war. It was like give and let go and take. So it was a continuous collaborative effort which was going to get them this result. You had to work in partnership with the demons and asuras and gods. Every time they pulled, the head of the Vasuki snake spewed poison onto the asuras because it's a snake. So when it was being pressurized from the head, what came out of the mouths? Hundred headed snake, lots and lots of venom. And that came into the ocean too. So what happens when you churn up the environment, the ocean, the atmosphere, good comes out of it and also a lot of bad, a lot of poisonous, toxic things, a lot of minerals. You have to learn to manage these things, what is what Vishnu had said to Indra. Beware Indra, there'll be many, many things that come out of the ocean. You need to recognize the good from the not so good. You need to manage what might harm you. You might have to choose and take what is right, which is full. You need to use that discretion, which only the devas had and not the asuras. So asuras were waiting. When is the pot of Amrit going to come? The first thing that came was this mythical tree as they were churning. This is the wish fulfilling tree called Kalpavriksh. And it, the devas let it go into the heaven. Suddenly the Mount Mandara shook and it started to slip. They cried out to Lord Vishnu, we are not able to churn anymore. The Mount of Mandara is sinking into the ocean. So Lord Vishnu turns himself into this giant tortoise and goes into the bed of the ocean and supports the Mount of Mandara. And he supports the action hoping that good will come out of it because of the intention of the devas. As the churning happens and they're pulling and pushing and giving and taking many other things, there are minerals that come out and there's a poisonous blue liquid that comes out and nobody knows how it's going to end up because of this. It's going dark in the night and there's a, a lot of smoke and they're not able to handle the toxins. So the implore and Lord Shiva, please help us. What is this blue substance that is coming out of the ocean? We weren't prepared for this. So Shiva promptly comes there and he holds his hand and just devours the blue poisons that come out of the ocean. And he knows it's even bad for him as it enters his body. So he has the superpower to hold the blueness in his neck which is why he's also called the Nilakanta. So the blue poison is all sucked up and Lord Shiva withholds the damage that might have happened to all the devas and the asuras and the whole world. So now they can carry on. They're still churning and churning. It takes a long time. There is this holy cow and called the Kamadenu that comes out of it. It is the wish-fulfilling cow, the one that for eternally gives milk and the life force to the, all the people who have it. So it is transported automatically. Its wish is to go to heaven. So it goes to the Deva's home. Then there are beautiful Apsaras like Ramba and Menaka, the fairies come out of it. There are gemstones and chemicals and minerals that come out of it. On the two days before Deepavali on the Dhana Trayodashi, there is a Dhanavantari goddess, a god that arrives with a big pot full of this Amrit, which is supposed to be a life source which makes them eternally powerful. This is the Amrit that they were waiting for. 
the Bali king knows, the Asura king knows that he, this is what we wanted. He immediately, with lightning speed, grabs it out of Dhanvantari's arms and tries to flee. Devas again implore Vishnu and say, what do we do now? He's running away with Amrit, which is why we were trying to turn the ocean and get back our lost glory and power. So Lord Vishnu calls upon his mythical companion bird, the Garuda, and he says, Garuda, chase Bali and get the Amrit back. It needs to be shared fairly. So Garuda goes and procures this. Within no time, the pot of Amrit is back and out of the uh, ocean comes this beautiful fairy Mohini, who's mesmerizing beauty enchants the asuras. They have forgotten the main purpose of why they were here. They're looking at her and amazed. They just want to keep staring at her. This is actually Vishnu in the avatar, in the, in the form of Mohini. Mohini takes the pot of, golden pot of Amrit out of Bali's hand that Garuda guided him to come and says, now I'm going to hold this till you finish churning. And it's the darkest night. They've been churning for many nights and many days. And on this day, goddess Lakshmi arrives out of the ocean in a beautiful big lotus, bedecked with golden jewels and beautiful red silk sari. And she is glowing and she is the source of light for the entire universe. And it was a dazzling sight for everybody to see. They are so surprised that it's called the Amavasya is the darkest night of the month. And what is this? It's almost like daylight. This is beautiful. And we can see everybody, we can see each other and we feel confident with light. So they are happy to have Lakshmi there. And Vishnu in the, in the form of Mohini says, let me now distribute the magical and super powerful liquid Amrit to everybody. It's the nectar that they've been waiting for. Mohini says, now all you Devas and all you Asuras, listen to me. Please sit down in a nice row. I'm going to walk around and give you a small portion for everyone. Mohini goes and starts with the Asuras because they didn't try to steal it. Start with the Devas and get, starts to share the Amrit with them. By the time she comes to the last of the Devas, magically the Amrit pot is empty, even though there was plenty in it. The Asuras were not meant to have it. So they feel very upset. Mohini explains to them that the intention why the devas wanted was to get their powers to do good for the entire universe. The intention why you wanted it was to become all powerful and rule the world and take over the world and continue to do the ravaging things and destructive things that you were doing all along. So unfortunately, it's your own wish that has done this to you. So they pray to Goddess Lakshmi and they say, we want this light. We want to have brightness in our life. Please help us. Lakshmi says, I'm meant to go with Vishnu. He's my husband. And I'm going to join him now. And we are going to be united now to live and manage and find this balance in the universe forever. But Vishnu say, tells them, don't worry, even if the light of Lakshmi and her sheik joins me in heaven, that anybody who lights a lamp and lights it with devotion in an earthen pot with oil and a wick made of cotton and takes another lamp and takes light from that and makes a string of lights on this darkest night of the month, your homes that have these lamps and lights will be a sign of welcoming Lakshmi and she will in spirit be in your home and be there to bring you health, prosperity, happiness, peace and a balanced life. 
you will be sharing and caring with the goodness that you got from the Deva story. So that is symbolic, an earthen clay lamp, like the ones that I have just lit behind me, are symbolic of uh, Lakshmi and welcoming her into us. The Dhanvantari goddess that brought the uh, Amrit out of the ocean is supposed to be the beginning of Ayurveda in the Hindu culture, the Indian mythology, where good health is available for everybody. Amrit is supposed to be how good health and longevity and prosperity is given to everyone in the measure that they need, as you need, is what is said. So as Shreya mentioned, the story of um, Deepavali has many versions, but I chose this to tell you how the importance of Lakshmi, light, prosperity, churning of the ocean, bringing good health in the form of uh, Amrit, peace and joy for everybody is what we all wish for each other on this Deepavali night, following the Dhan Teras and Naraka Chaturdashi and Deepavali. This is the darkest night of the month when we celebrate with lots of lamps, a prayer to Goddess Lakshmi as we invoke her into our lives on this night and pray to her to stay with us for the whole entire year to make us prosperous, to give us the ability to share and care as we are able to um, as we are able to enjoy the celebrations in different forms as wearing the best clothes, decorating our homes, um, making the yummy sweets and giving those to everybody that we love. So this is this important, most important story of why we pray to Lord Devi Lakshmi on the Deepavali night. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vijaya. Yes, it is the essence of the family that the story that you shared just now. All the churning of the Milky Ocean is also the churning that goes on within us to give us something Absolutely. that we transcend and we leave the evil or the bad things and the ignorance behind and go out to get, well, the elixir of life. And then share it with everyone. It's not something that you keep to yourself. You light, you light up yourself and your light lights up the lives of others. Absolutely. That is the basic essence of the Bible. And I think there is so much similarity of giving, of loving, of sharing, of peace amongst all the stories. What uh, Stefania told right in the beginning to Andrea's story, to yours, what you all are sharing, it's the stories, the core theme is all about giving. It's all about lighting one's own light and giving it to others. It's so beautiful. Thank the you. Story that um, we just now, we were listening to stories I, uh, and they are all, uh, so far all the stories are coming from uh, the core of our hearts and uh, told so beautifully. I just remembered a poem which was written by Ravindranath Tagore and in his book, Itanjali, that uh, he got the Nobel Prize for. And uh, in Gitanjali, there is a poem where the poet talks about the ever encompassing light, the light of his life. And he praises it and he goes for it. It is in Bangla, uh, my mother tongue. But if I say, I mean, if I say the poem in Bangla, I don't think anybody will understand. So I will try to read out a translation of that poem. It goes uh, in Bangla like, Alo Amar Alo Go Alo Kubon 
it says light my light that fills the world kisses my eyes and warms my heart the light dances at the center of my life the light strikes the chords of my love the sky opens the wind runs wild laughter passes over the earth the butterflies spread their sails on the sea of light flowers lilies jasmines surge up on the crest of the light light waves the light is shattered into gold on every cloud and it scatters gems in profusion mirth spreads from leaf to leaf and gladness without measure the rivers of the heaven has overflowed its banks and the flood of joy abounds my light it fills the world and fills my life i think in such a small poem it's all about the light that has lit up our lives going on and moving on to our next storyteller a country which is a very close neighbor of ours a country that consists of over 17000 islands that are in between the indian and the pacific yeah. oceans islands and countries that's so beautiful and rich in its physical beauty and in its culture and heritage a country that's full of stories a country that has some of the warmest people in it a loving country indonesia and we have aryo zidni from indonesia with us today he's a storyteller and also a writer and especially writes for children which is unique i think and it's too good it's very difficult to write for children aryo is also the founder of the indonesian international storytelling festival and very especially the gulali festival this is the first festival of art performance for children in indonesia a very warm and lovely person aryo will share with us the next story welcome aryo bumi tunjang kanci langit telak ada cerita ada dongeng semua menyambut cerita the stars the moon the clouds and the sun they're welcoming the story welcoming the light it's a story in a small village in the island of java it's a village full of happy villagers they are farmers 
the wife of farmers, the children of farmers, living together with the nature, creating happiness in life with songs, music, and dance. It's part of the way of the Japanese people living Ler iler, ler iler, tandure was a miller, ta ijo royo royo, ta tengku teman ten anyar. Every morning when they woke up, welcoming the light, they sing a song. They're making music and they dance while they're working on the paddy field in their village. They sing a song. They're making music and they dance. That happened all day long. Because they really love to make themselves happy. And every night before they put off the light, before they go to sleep, they will sing a song, making music. And did a little dance. They're telling a stories, a lullaby with music. One day, deep in the forest, lived a giant demon called Kalarahu. Well, this Kalarahu is not really happy with all the music, the dancing and the singing. Well, actually, this giant demon Kalarahu never want to be happy at all. Mm. I hate those humans who always sing a song, making music and dance. I hate those happy villagers. And that he thought maybe if Kalarahu can have quite gigantic power, he can do something about it. And he remembered the God's place. There is a pond with water called Tirta Amerta. If a person or a god can drink that water, that water will give you powers. Then he flew to the god's place. And then he saw Tirta Amrta spawn. He walked and he walked and reached out his hand to take the water in his palm and drink the water. Oof. 
but Batara Vishnu, so that that's not a god or even a human that's been rewarded to drink in Tirta Amrita. He drew his weapon called Chakra and threw it to that giant demon Kalarahu and BAM! Suddenly, the soul of Kalarahu separated with his body. His body flew to the earth. Bam. And the soul, the dark soul of Kalarahu was flew the sky with anger dark energy, Kalarahu want to take revenge. He said, I will punish the human to punish the God with my soul. I will eat everything that gave life to human. So Kalarahu flew and ate the stars, the moon, and the sun. Everything became dark on earth. All the people, including the happy villagers in that village in Java Island, were so scared because darkness came in a very long time. They were scared. They gathered, but nothing to do. They got panic. Some are screaming, some are crying. There are no good things at that time in the darkness. Until somebody did this. Mm. Someone was humming, making a music, humming a song, and made the others happy. And then some people responded. And everyone started to sing, making music and dance. They clap, they hit the window, the door, the walls, the rocks, the trees to make music. Because music turned them from sad and scared into happy. And they hit something that was very big lying there on the ground. They hit that really hard to make big noise, big music, happy music. And you know what? That thing 
is the body of Kalarahu. And then when the body get hit over and over again, the soul became sick. Then, through up all the things that were swollen before, the stars, the moon, and the sun. And there came the light. Since that day, in Java Island, when somebody was feeling lonely, sad, or scared, they will sing a song, making music, or dance. And during the eclipse, all the villagers in Java Island they will make music, dance, sing a song. They will hit everything to make sounds, to make Kalarahu go away and welcoming the lights. <laughs> Tandure was a miller, ta ijoro yoro yota tenggu temanten. Thank you. What an awesome story, Ayo. It's just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story. And I think there's so much, uh, you know, similarity with uh, the Indian stories and Indonesian stories that I just got lost in that. It's so beautiful. And you told it so well. Thank you for being with us today. And in, uh, the story itself says a lot, but. Um, Coming to today's theme of, you know, uh, of uh, triumph of good over evil, of this, uh, of light, this light coming to, into our lives. Uh, do you celebrate in Indonesia's, you know, festivals or things like this? Celebrate light. Yeah, some part in Indonesia. Uh, well, as you said, we have 17,000 islands and it's also, we have a thousand culture, different cultures in Indonesia spread from uh, Aceh until Papua. And those different culture, we also have a, a different celebration uh, uh, regarding to, uh, related to lights. Uh, for example, also in Java, we have this, uh, the biggest temple uh, in Java called Borobudur. It's in the central of Java in uh, Magelang. Uh, every year in Vaisak, we have uh, the celebration of life, the festival of life. So I think it's quite similar to uh, Diwali. Beautiful, no? How it's all connected. The world is connected, and how we are all so similar across the world in different uh, countries and different cultures. But in the core of it, we are all the same. Thank you for sharing the story. Now, we have already heard stories from the far west. We will go to the country in the far east from India. It is a country which is lush green, a country of hilly countryside that is dotted with cherry trees, ancient Buddhist temples, a country of ancient cultures, a country of utmost beauty, the Republic of Korea. And here we have Alicia Dongju Bang. 
she has delighted children and adults with her storytelling performances for years. Alicia is also the director of International Storytelling Festival in South Korea, her country. Alicia is also the founder of Story School and the Korea International Storytellers Association. Thank you, Alicia, for, for being here with us today. And we are now eager to listen to the story that you bring to Lights and Legends. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being inviting me today. Uh, today is the Halloween, so I'm going to share a beautiful story night with you through my storytelling. Are you ready? Yes? Okay. A long, long, long time ago, in the land of morning come, there was a man who had a three sons, but no daughter. So he wanted to have a daughter so much. Every night he climbed up the mountain and prayed for the God. Oh God, please, please give me a daughter. I have only three sons, but I really, really want to have a daughter, please. Oh, mountain god, please give me a daughter. Please give me a daughter. But you know, in the deep, deep, deep mountain, there was a deep, dark cave. There was a scary fox with nine tails. She heard the prayer and then she was looking at the man. But the man didn't know anything about it. Soon his wife was pregnant. She had a beautiful little girl. The man was so happy, of course. And he loved the little daughter so much, more than his three sons. Everything was fine, but when she was six years old, Strange things began to happen in his house. Every night, when the full moon came around and around, a cow would die. In the morning, they could never find out who killed the cow. So one night, the man called the first son. My son, please come here. Tonight, you should keep watch the cow. Can you do that? Yes. Yes, I can do this. All right. Then, the first son tried to keep watch the cow. But everything was fine for the moment. But when the full moon came around and around, um, he was so sleepy and oh, mm, mm, oh. oh no, the first son had fallen asleep. In the morning, when he woke up, he saw that a cow had died. He was so worried and he was so afraid that his father would get angry, so he lied to his father. Father, father, I watched the cows all night long, but nothing happened. 
I think, the full moon. It must be, it must be, frightened by the full moon. The father thought it's very strange things, but um, okay, I think so. But so strange. But all right, we can keep watch, and then you should keep watch and. The cows were all together. The next day, it was the second son to watch the cows. Everything was fine for the moment, but when the full moon came out, round and round and round, and also the second son was so sleepy, and he tried to keep watch, but. He had fallen asleep, and the same things happened. In the morning, he saw the cow had died, so he also worried, and he also afraid that his father would get angry. So he lied to father, and he told the same story like his older brother. Has said, hmm. So it was the youngest son turned to keep watch the cows. The youngest son that night he prepared some beans because he didn't want to sleep. Everything was fine for a moment, but when the full moon came up in the sky and Shine around and around and around. Then, of course, the sun. Oh, he was so sleepy, but he tried to keep watch the cows.、Mm, I have to, I have to keep watch the cow for my family, and he started eating corn. Hmm, hmm. But at the moment, he heard a strange sound. What sound is that? It sounds like someone is opening the door. Yes, yes. His little sister came out of her room, and she went to the barn, and she stopped in front of the cow, and then. <gasps> There was a little sister, but she actually she wasn't a little sister anymore. She was a fox demon with nine tails, and she turned into owl. <laughs> My delicious cow, <sighs> and she started to lick. Um, her hand, and then she put her hand into the cow's stomach and pulled out the legs. And、um, my delicious liver. Um, now and more, more liver. I can be a human being. <laughs> <laughs> oh! The, the youngest son was so shocked, and in the morning he went to the father. Father, father, wake up, wake up! Do you know who killed the cow? Please, please, you must be very surprised. And our younger sister, my younger sister. Killed the cow. The last night, she actually she wasn't my younger sister. She was a fox demon. But his father, he didn't believe him. What? What nonsense are you saying, my son? What are you doing? She is just a little girl. Oh, maybe you must be have fallen asleep. Huh? You were supposed to keep the cows, but 
you failed me. And then all you can do is blame to your little lovely sister. Get out! Get out of my house! No, no, father, please believe me. She is not my younger sister. She is a fox demon. Please believe me. No! At the moment, the younger sister came out. Father, what happened? Brother, brother, it's me. I'm your younger sister. Why you keep calling me a cow? I'm so scared, the cow, and I'm so scared, the fox. I'm, a, I'm not a fox. I'm your younger sister. Please believe me. No, no, you are a fox demon. Stay, stay out of me. Please get out. And his father was so angry. Get out. Get out of my house and never come back to me. And then the man kicked out his the youngest son. Oh, poor youngest son. Then the youngest son was wandering around here and there countryside. Eventually, a, an old wise monk took him to his temple. The youngest son stayed inside the temple and he studied hard with the wise monk for a long, long, long time. This is the end of my story. Do you think is this the end? No! This is how our story began to start. Ten years later, the youngest one grew up. And one day, he really missed his family. So he decided to return to his house. Before he left, the wise monk gave him three magic bottles. One was white. One was blue, one was red. My boy, these magic bottles and use this when you get in trouble and you will be able to defeat your fox demon sister. Thank you, my master. And then when he returned to his house, you know, what did he see? He found a little sister all alone. He was so surprised. Oh, sister, where is father? Where is mother? Where are my brothers? Where are they? Brother, they all die. I live in the huge house all alone. I'm so scared. When they, you left, they were so, so sad, and they got sick, and they died. So, but anyway, I'm so happy. You, I'm so glad you came back to my house. Please stay with me. The youngest son was afraid. Oh, no. No, my sister, I must, I must go. You stay in the house, I have to go. No, brother, I still think I'm a fox. No, I'm not a fox. Look at me, look at my eyes. I'm your sister. Please believe me. Oh, the youngest son thought about her. Her eyes are so adorable. She smiled at him. Oh, he felt so happy. Brother, please look out the window. It's already dark. Please stay at least one night. Please. I want to, I want to make dinner for you. Please. 
and then he was so tired and he wanted to sleep and take a rest. So he decided to stay the house only one night. Of course, he was so tired. He ate dinner and then he fell asleep. But in the middle of the night, he heard strange sound. My brother, did you sleep well? I'm your sister. <laughs> Today is the day I need one more liver. <laughs> Stupid human. <laughs> so you came home tonight. Now you are my meal. Please give me your liver. I need your liver. And then I can be a human being tonight. <laughs> the youngest brother was so shocked. And she quickly ran out of his room and started to run. But the fox sister chased him. <laughs> I'm going to get you. Please give me a liver. Please give me a liver. Please give me a liver. And the man, the youngest brother, he remembered. He had magic three balls, bottles. And he took out the first bottle, white one, and he threw the bottle at the fox. Suddenly, a thorn bush stopped the little sister. But the little sister was a fox. <laughs> I am a fox. I can easily get out of these bushes. <laughs> of course. But she was breathing all her body. But she kept chasing the younger brother. <laughs> Brother, brother, give me a liver, give me a liver. Then the brother remembered he got another bottle and he took out the blue bottle and threw it at the fox. Ah! This time a large liver appeared. But fox sister said, <laughs> I am a fox. I can easily swim across. I can across the river. <laughs> of course, she came. She swam across the river and she was almost to catch the little boy. And then finally, he remembered the third one. The red bottle. He took out the red bottle. A bad demon sister kill you. And then this time the red, a big red bird appeared oh, around the fox sister. There's only the little younger brother. He was looking at the sister. She was not a, his sister anymore. She was a fox anymore. Just everything just disappeared. This is the end of my story.
the fox sister. Oh! This story um, is very popular Korean folk tales that has been published in many, many picture books. The original version is entitled The Boy Who Killed Fox Sister, which is part of our lines of Korean oral literature, Unit 7, Chapter 17. This story is retold by me. I changed the characters of the brothers and I have retold this story two times. One time um, at an international storytelling festival in India in 2016 and another time in South Korea during the Paju Book uh, Festival in 2015. I love this story. Uh, there are so many, okay, and Korean folk tales. Fox appeared in many Korean folk tales. Unlike Western folk tales, which show the fox as being very smart and sly, fox in Korean, our book tells show the fox as being very scary and fearful, yet also very attractive. Foxes in Korean folk tales also want to turn into humans because she really wants to be a human and because they don't like their form and tails and teeth. And since they can seem to be attractive, foxes in Korean folk tales often want to turn into a beautiful woman, but a dangerous one. In scary Korean stories and dramas, and if a man has a wife who betrayed him, the man's friends might say, that the man's wife is a fox with nine uh, tails, Korean word kumiyo, and that has many secrets. Uh, as an international storyteller, and storytellers can be help children make their own scary fox mask, something like this. Some people think this story is too scary, but actually, kids like scary stories, especially around mm, the time of Halloween. So, talking about this story is a good way to let children know that there are scary things in the world, but they can be defeated. So storytellers can also explain the important role of the mask in the many cultures. And for adult uh, listeners, if you listen to my story, if you are an adult, so um, storyteller can explain how harmful it can be when parents show too much to a child, just like the father in the story. Uh, showed his daughter much more love than his son, showed his sons, even though his daughter is a fox, right? So his overly strong love made him blind. So sometimes, you know, I always think that um, we are born in storyteller because we have our own story to tell. Stories like a light, you know, story can shine everywhere. So you should keep the light, your stories to share with someone you loved. Sometimes COVID-19 is the darkness, so we need a story light. That's why tonight I would like to share this story with you. And I always think that a um, story, um, people, a person need a, a story light more than food to stay alive.
This is the end of my story. Thank you for listening to my story. So much, so much sharing your story and your light. And um, it's just wonderful. I mean, we sat mesmerized as you took us so dramatically in the parts of uh, your country to your customs and uh, the story is so beautiful. It actually is uh, that it tells you that in the end, the truth wins. You can overcome all kinds of adversity. You can overcome all kinds of evil if you really want to. And it is just such, such a wonderful story to be with you and to listen to your story. And here, you know, sometimes uh, I'll just share a, a small anecdote with you before we just uh, leave. Uh, a young student went to his teacher and asked, when the light darkness is dawn, so how do I differentiate between the light and the dark? How do I know when and where is the light and when darkness. How do I find it when I look at dawn? The teacher looked at his students and smiled and said, only when you look into the face of every man and woman and you see your kin in that, your brother or your sister or your mother or your father, somebody you know, somebody you love in that. Only then you will have seen the light and everything else is darkness. Today, in this evening when we are all sharing stories, I think the light of each and every one of you that of you that you shared your own light it has illuminated this entire place and i find a lot of kinship in all of you in your, all of you storytellers and today as we stand together i think we all bind the world together from the west to the east and all of us, we are finding the entire world with stories and our love and our light. I think I will cherish every moment that you have shared with me. And I think I have made friends that will last my entire lifetime. I will see you again and again in a lot of more storytelling sessions, even. And if possible, I would like to see you live, not on the other side of the uh, of uh, this computer screen, but see you and meet you. Maybe someday it might happen, but otherwise, I take this opportunity to thank you so much for being here. As we say in our Sanskrit slope, we say, Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Brityurma Amritam Gamaya. It means lead me from unreality to real, from falsehood to truth. Lead me from darkness to light. Lead me from death to immortality. And with this, I will say thank you to each and every one of you for telling your stories and to everyone who will be listening to these stories. We share our love, our light with the rest of the world. May there be love, may there be peace, may there be joy in everyone. And I would request here, Stefania, Vijaya, Alicia, all of you are here. If you can say one sentence, if you can share your love and peace in your own language with the rest of the audience who is listening to us. Stefania. Stefania, can you unmute yourself, please? 
auguro a tutti dopo questo periodo difficile buio di trovare la luce sapendo che ognuno di noi contiene molta luce so after this difficult and dark period i wish everyone that can find the light through his life but uh, being aware that we have a lot of light inside and uh, we can also shine thank you so much Alicia. Alicia, please, can you go on? Mm. Storytelling and storytelling are the same as the story. The story is the same as the story. The story is the same as the s 차세대 어린이를 위해서 많은 이야기를 함께 나누는 스토리텔러가 되었으면 좋겠습니다. Thank you very much from South Korea. 사랑합니다. 그리고 감사합니다. Should I go? So uh, India has many, many languages and I'm from the south of India and the state of Telangana, a place called Hyderabad and Telugu is my language, my mother tongue. Um, in Telugu we say, Andar ki sakala santo shalato, ayur arogya aishwarya lato, Deepavali subha This is like a Deepavali best wishes to everybody. May your life be filled with every joy that you wish for yourself, with a long life, good health, and a lot of prosperity. Thank you so much. And like Shreya said, I'm honored to be in this esteemed gathering and loved every story that you shared. Thank you so much. I will say in Bangla, Shavar Jivon Anundamoy Hok, Alumoy Hok. May there be a lot of light, love, and light in each one of you. Have a very happy day. And thank you all the storytellers for being with us. I think Ario and Andrea had to leave a little early, but uh, their love and their light they have already shared with us. And from all of you, lots of love to you and wish you a very, very, very happy Deepavali. And we will all stay connected. Thank you so Adiwali. much. Deepavali. Thank you. Best wishes to everyone. Best wishes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shreya. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.